You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Hello and welcome to the US-China Trade War Podcast. I am Finbar Birmingham on the Political Economy Desk at the South China Morning Post. We are back in our Times Square studio this week to bring you an update on the absolute havoc being wrought on trade and supply chains around China, around Asia and soon to be around the world from the coronavirus epidemic. And for this purpose, I am delighted to say we've got the band back together. Political economy editor John Carter has returned from his sabbatical in the United States and he joins his co-editor Joe Shin in the studio to discuss the situation inside China. And I am doubly delighted to welcome a very special guest to the podcast. Trin Wen is a senior economist at Natixis in Hong Kong, but you may know her better from her dynamite economics Twitter account, Trinomics. Trin has this week been taking to Twitter to do thread after thread dissecting the impact of the coronavirus on Asia Pacific supply chains. We're going to be discussing with Trin how, despite all the time when we're talking about trade and supply chains, we talk about factories, we talk about machines, we talk about ships, but what is it at its very heart but people? The coronavirus has served as a very timely reminder that without people you have no supply chain. We're also going to be discussing Vietnam with Trin. Now, we've been reporting for a couple of years now the red-hot flow of manufacturers out of China and into Vietnam. But what we've learned over the past month, China is a bit like Hotel California. You can never leave. All this and more on a bumper issue of the US-China Trade War podcast. Hold on to your hats. Delighted to be back in the studio with political economy editors John Carter and Joe Shin. This was a week again where we were supposed to see China go back to work. Joe Shin, what has been the reality on the ground? Is China back in business? Uh, Well, uh, it's certainly, you know, the message Beijing is trying to deliver to the whole world is that the Chinese economy is going back to work very quickly. And uh, you can see that the official figures say 90% of factories have already opened for business in Guangdong and a a similar rate in uh, Zhejiang and Jiangsu, you know, the major manufacturing export bases. But actually, uh, the devil are in the details, you know. Um, Because the official figure only measures those factories with certain are above the state-designated uh, scale, which means factories with annual turnover above 20 million yuan. So leaving the great majority of the small businesses, small service provider out. Mm. So the big guys are back in business, but for the small businesses, it doesn't look so rosy, John. No. Only another survey shows that only 30% of small businesses are back in operation. And this is particularly important because 80% of the employment in China is in such small businesses. So this presents a big problem for Beijing. They need those small businesses to come back online to get people to work. And if they don't work, then you have a huge unemployment problem, which could create a social stability problem, which is Beijing's worst fear. Yeah, unemployment problem would imply that these businesses are never coming back. And Zhou Xin, is that a realistic proposition? Uh, yes, um, because even in among the big companies, um, I mean, like ninety percent of them having opened for business. Yes, but how, you know, how many workers are there actually? You know, you, you usually have normally you have one thousand workers, and now you have only two hundred w- migrant workers in your factory, and you still report to the government that yes, we are opening for business. But the real situation on the ground could, could be much, uh, you know, bleak than the uh, official figures suggest. Mm-hmm. Um, by all possible data we can gather from the transport departments, we can say uh, with quite confidence that at least half of Chinese migrant workers are still staying at home, are still not in their uh, right positions yet Mm. at this stage. I think just to put a bit of perspective on it, you know, that's hundreds of millions of of people, probably bigger than the workforces of most countries in the world, John. Oh, indeed. And and some of them don't want to come back because of their fear of the virus. And some of them can't physically make the journey because of travel restrictions put up to uh, prevent the spread of the virus. And, uh, and several million of these migrant workers in Hubei province, for instance, which is the epicenter of the epidemic. Tomorrow we will see the first real gauge as to what is the actual official impact on the economy uh, when the Purchasing Manager Index for uh, February comes out on Saturday morning. Joe Shane, we did have a couple of other little surveys and so on which 
showed perhaps what uh, a taste of what's to come. Uh, small businesses in, in pretty bad nick in China. I would be quite surprised if tomorrow's PMI is not an all-time low. Uh, because even if the, you know, the government PMI is covering uh, big companies in general, but still, uh, the situation is uh, pretty bad. I mean, for a purchasing manager, what do you can purchase in a situation like this? Yeah. You can buy nothing. Yeah, and uh, John, give us a give for those who, uh, for the unacquainted, what is the purchasing managers index and why is it important? Well, it's a survey um, of purchasing managers, uh, the the officials of a company who do the purchasing. So they they're giving uh, a sense of the heartbeat of the company, how well it's performing. They're asked a series of questions: How's your production this month compared to last month? How are your new orders this month compared to last month? And you create an index out of those uh, answers to those questions. Uh, it is important because it's the first official piece of data each month that gives you a sense of uh, the, the tone of the economy. Um, and what, as Joe Shin said, what we're expecting is a very weak reading implying contraction in the manufacturing sector in China in, in February, uh, perhaps worse than during the global financial crisis, or at least as bad. Yeah. These are, I mean, we, we all receive uh, these emails and, and analyst notes from the big investment banks and from the credit rating agencies and so on. I am always perplexed by the fact that all of these uh, economists are still forecasting growth in the first quarter for, for the Chinese economy because I just don't understand, Joe Xin, when you have all the factories shut for a sustained period, when you have all the cinemas shut, all the karaoke bars, people are in lockdown, people can't go shopping. You know, the PMI may, may give us some indication of this, but it seems to me quite unfeasible that the, um, the economy is growing. Well, that's a very good point, Fing. But I think, uh, realistically, I don't think you know China can report any economic growth that uh, for the first quarter at least. It's now the end of February now, and we don't see like the economic activity has been you know back to normal. Uh, however, I think for the Chinese statisticians, I think it's very very difficult for them to report a, a deep contraction of the Chinese economy mm -hmm. for the first quarter. Because remember, uh, the you know, the guideline from the top Chinese leadership is that we have to achieve the 2020 economic goals. We have to realize our vision of building up a, a comprehensively wealth mm. society, which means China needs at least like 5.6% GDP growth rate this year. So they may s report a very low enough growth rate uh, after kind of seasonal adjustments or whatever, you know, statistics, methodologies you can ad adopt yeah. to achieve that. But realistically, I don't think China it can report any economic growth for this quarter. Just as all this is going on, we have to discuss the, the US-China situation. We had a story on hmm. Tuesday which said that despite everything that's going on in China, or everything that's not going on, maybe the operative term, the US still fully expects China to keep to its side of the bargain. Zhou Xin, there has been some steps made by China to sort of open up the market. Give us a quick update on what's happened on that front. Okay, I think China has been uh, doing this uh, baby step one after another in the last couple of weeks, you know, uh, lift all the kind of uh, import bans on American farm products from chickens, from beef. And this is, uh, as we have discussed before, this has two uh, reasons. For first, first of all, of course, China has to honor its uh, promises, have to show some gesture to the United States that we are still committed to the uh, trade deal. So you cannot you know, blame China of walking away from the deal you know, just one month after they signed it. And secondly, and possibly most importantly, because China is in need of uh, American farm products when the domestic situation is like mm -hmm. this. China needs more chickens from American. China needs more beef from American because uh, the, uh, the coronavirus at the end of the day is a, is a huge shock to supply at home. Yeah. Joe Shin talks about the need for um, more agricultural products from the United States. John, it's worth uh, maybe illustrating for the listeners the dire straits the Chinese agricultural sector finds itself in with the cross-provincial roadblocks, with the lockdowns, meaning that farmers can't get to their animals. I mean, that's a real bad situation. No, indeed. And they cannot get to their animals. And when they can get their animals, they can't get the feed to feed them. And so there's the prospect of a large uh, purge of the of the animal kingdom in, in China, meaning that China would ha need yet more chickens, yet more pork mm. than it would before. So yeah. arguably that will increase their demand. Um, but having said that, um, 
it's not clear that that will, will take place. I mean, we've seen that China has removed their barriers as part of the trade deal, but they haven't made any large purchases of U.S. grain at the moment. Mm-hmm. So we're waiting for that. We'll see when that happens. And just a quick note on that. I had a conversation with somebody who sells uh, equipment that's used in hatcheries in China. I mean, these guys monitor a billion chickens in China every year, right? And he, this person said to me that they expect... Um, laying chickens, the laying hens in China to be down to 20% of what they were in December. Wow. Um, so that gives an idea as to, I mean, that's just, I mean, there are obviously eggs to follow that. So, you know, it, there, there's a supply chain, <laughs> which came first, I'm not sure, but it's just an illustration of how, how bad the, the situation could be. We just want to finish up uh, with Zhu Xin. Very interesting story from China's border in Mongolia. Tell us a little bit about that very colorful story you were speaking about in the office earlier today. Oh, yes. Uh, this is uh, yesterday, the, you know, the Mongolia president visited uh, China and uh, uh, have a meeting with President Xi Jinping. And uh, one of the highlights of the meeting is that the Mongolia president offered China 30,000 sheep as a gift to support China's fight against the coronavirus. And it instantly reminds the Chinese public how the tradition, you know, going, going through the millenniums, you know, the Mongolians just giving uh, sheep to the emperor, and then the emperor promised it back, like, whatever you want, you know, we just to give it back. Possibly this time, uh, it's a sheep for mask deal. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thanks very much, Joe Shin. John, thank you. Great to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Train. It's Finbar. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Are you guys still working from home? Delighted to be joined on the line by Train Wen, who is the Hong Kong-based senior economist at Natexas. Train, thanks so much for joining us. We've been really enjoying your coverage, um, the tweets that you've been doing, and also some of the, the notes and the articles that you've been writing about the impact of the coronavirus on the supply chain and on China's labour market this week and last week. Uh, I think what we both agree on is that at the heart of all of this is a people issue. Um, Despite the constant talk about supply chain automation and innovation, what we've seen over the past month is if you don't have people, you don't have a supply chain, right? Absolutely. So if you look at China, uh, global market share for manufacturing, and you know that China has um, basically 19% of global market share, manufacturing global market share. But within that, its market share for some items are much greater. Um, so although it has moved up the value chain, uh, become low tech oriented, most of the items where they have the highest share is labor intensive. And even in tech items, uh, labor is so important because you need labor to put it all together, uh, even though it's increasingly um, uh, uh, more capital intensive. And what that means is that the sectors that depend on the workers, and we know there are a lot of them. Um, you know, the labor force is roughly 800 something, but of which uh, 770 million are being employed. Um, so, so this is a staggering a number of people. We're talking about continental in size, um, and the fact that they weren't able to work uh, um, for for almost a month. And although this normalization process is happening every day, more uh, migrant workers are going back to work. We still have in the hundreds of millions shortage of labor. Um, and what that means is that firms have to pay more for labor. Um, and although some may be able to get more through bonuses such as Foxconn, um, as reported by your paper, um, others such as the smaller ones that cannot compete are not able to get the necessary labor we need. And essentially, at the macro basis, you can't really hedge this away until we have uh, 100% resumption of activities. Um, and, and even if you were to be able to get workers, it would be, have an implication of erosion of profit margins because you do have to pay more to get these workers because there's a scarcity of workers. Yeah. Obviously, on the inverse side, if you're a laborer, you get more bargaining power. Obviously. Well, that yeah, I mean that's good good for the for the you know the av- everyday laborer, but I think what we're, we're seeing here and we we see this in a number of different ways but this is bad for the small guys you mentioned foxconn just for the listeners foxconn has been paying extravagant bonuses as a way to sort of draw in some laborers and some workers from other companies because it's so desperate to get its production up and running and train just tell us what is the sort of long-term 
implications for for the rest of the supply chain when you've got a big giant like Foxconn coming in and throwing throwing its money about in that way? Absolutely, it means that it, if Foxconn were able to resolve this problem and and with deep pockets, um, um, uh, you can resolve this. You just have to pay um, higher costs. Uh, where, whereas in the smaller companies, uh, smaller manufacturers that don't have deep pockets, don't have the brand, don't have the pool um, uh, to pay for the. Uh, 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 the cost of labor, then they are not able to get labor, right? So, for example, in that story that you wrote, one third of SMEs in China are not yet open because of this labor issue. And I think that's going to continue to be the case. So although on an aggregate level, um, you have a shortage returning uh, to normal over time, the question is a duration, but at a micro level, you have huge differentiation in terms of the pain or the, the ripple effect this will have on. What that means is that you're still going to have shortages. So if, let's say, a screw company is not able to get workers, if that screw is important in the inputs of key electronics, key manufactured goods, you still have supply chain shortage disruption. And that's going to be uh, 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 profound, not just for China, but for neighboring economies that depend on these inputs and for the global supply chain, for the big brands that depend on the manufacturers in um, Asia to, to put together uh, the orders they make. Um, so that disruption alone, I think, will uh, be a drag for global growth. And that, I mean, that's a huge thing, uh, something I've been focusing on in my reporting this week, a story which is coming out on Friday afternoon about the downstream effect on Vietnam. Uh, I mean, over the past couple of years, we've been reporting extensively about how Vietnam is, I suppose, a winner from the US-China trade war because a lot of manufacturing has gone there, a lot of finishing plants, a lot of assembly lines. But I think what we have learned this month and, and perhaps end of January is that even if you leave China, you never really leave China because you're still dependent on all the, the widgets, the screws that you mentioned that are a vital part of the stuff that's assembled in Haiphong or in Ho Chi Minh City on these big sprawling industrial parks in, in Vietnam. So, so Trin, tell us about the, the hit that the Vietnamese economy is going to take from this coronavirus epidemic. So there are three things, right? China has global market share in three key sectors. All manufacturing, but textile, um, electronics, um, household goods, right? These sectors are increasingly what Vietnam has, what we call a China plus one strategy. It's an arbitrage to Vietnam because of its geographical uh, location, its favorable trade. Note that Vietnam has an EU FTA. China doesn't have it. So companies love Vietnam because it has cheap input costs. Now, but the Vietnam supply chain is developing suddenly, and it still needs input from China, as I mentioned, textile, electronics, these key sectors. And, and not just that, um, um, the disruption in the labor force in China means that even if you were to get these inputs, the borders um, are, are actually being stuck, right? So you have administrative issues as well. That is going to impact Vietnam on the supply chain and its ability to get the inputs for production in the short term. Um, and it has the largest dependency on China in Asia in terms of shared GDP. The second one is really Malaysia, uh, and Vietnam is by a wide margin. But beyond the short-term story, Vietnam is likely to benefit from the longer-term story is that when we get over this shock, the the diversification play will be even greater. An example of that is I would juxtapose is Samsung Electronics and Apple supply chain. Um, Samsung Electronics diversified to Vietnam, and most of the inputs for Samsung are quite diverse, mostly South Koreans, are less dependent on China over time. Whereas Apple supply chain is very much dependent on Taiwanese, um, and Taiwanese depend on uh, mainland production mm -hmm. in China through FDI, and that in itself is going to impact. So I think increasingly people are going to have a Samsung electronic model of more diversification. Yeah. But the point is that it shows the cracks in the Southeast Asian model in terms of Vietnam exposure. Um, so there's going to be reduction, but you can never fully reduce your um, risk to China because it's quite a massive manufacturing center, not just from a supply side this perspective, it's also on the demand side, right? Vietnam also exports quite substantial amount of, of, of agri-products and manufacture goods to China. Mm -hmm. So that in itself is also being interrupted 
through um, the demand side of the channel, and, and a lot of it has a lot to do with labor again. Um, so I think the shocks are going to be felt um, for Vietnam on a macro basis quite essentially. But let's not forget, however, that it's coming from very high growth. So say if Vietnam were to be reduced GDP, GDP by one to two percentage, uh, it's still coming from a high seven. But an economy like Japan, where um, it's, it was having a problem growing on a positive basis, and South Korea that was growing 2% um, last year, it's going to have a harder time. You still have a drag from the balance sheet of income, right? So think that if these workers in China, it's very unlikely many of these rural workers are likely on an hourly wage and they're probably not getting paid for not going to work. Um, so that means that on the income side, they're going to be hit. Um, and so it's, it's very likely that you're going to have a shopping spree if you have less income. Mm. Now, that's going to be felt across the world because you're going to feel uh, deflated uh, from the decline of demand in many sectors, and that's going to have to spill over uh, in terms of on the demand side. So, so you may have a little bit of a positive shock from people hoarding, and if, uh, you know, and, and if the supply shock continues, you may have uh, some prices rising. Uh, but the reality is that the downward demand shock is likely to be the uh, the story of 2020 uh, versus uh, some some short term uh, here and there. So, so I think. I think that in itself is one of the reasons the commodity markets prices in much more aggressively in the beginning, and eventually you have equities uh, 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 having this sobering realization that um, earnings are likely to be hit by both supply and demand shocks from the coronavirus, particularly like as it infects. South Korea and Japan, these are both major economies of not just Asia, but the world and increasingly Italy and Europe. Um, and also it's coming over to the US, right? <laughs> yeah. Based on everything that you said, we can summarize this train by saying what an absolute mess we were faced with. And it's going to be a long few months ahead. Thanks so much, Train, for joining us. Uh, you can follow Train's updates on Twitter at Trainomics. It really is one of the most dynamic Twitter accounts following economics in this side of the world. Train, we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the US-China Trade War podcast. I have been Finbar Birmingham on our political economy desk here in Hong Kong. Don't forget to follow our team at SCMP Economy for all the updates on our stories. You can follow me at F Birmingham. That's Birmingham with a B-E-R, not like the city. We've also got a couple of other podcasts in the stable which look at the wider impact of the coronavirus on different aspects of life in China. Please take a moment to listen and subscribe to Inside China and Inside China Tech and we'll see you next week.